Great. Well, welcome everyone uh, to this fourth program in our clean energy funding series. And this program is on clean transportation. I'm Sherry Gruder, Sustainable Design Specialist and Energy Strategist with UW-Madison Extension and the Community Economic Development Program. We uh, decided to do an entire program on transportation because this area actually crosses all of the sectors from businesses and communities and tribes to local governments and schools and individuals. And it's a big sector of the um, transformation to a clean energy economy. So transportation produces 27% of the greenhouse gas emissions, at least in 2020, that was the case. Right now, the funding in the bipartisan infrastructure law known as BILL, and also in IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, allocates about 12% of all the funding, um, hundreds of billions of dollars, to create a clean transportation infrastructure in our country. And um, a lot of the funding is also coming, of course, from the private sector. So this is a huge investment, and it's going to be uh, a big transformation within the next five to 10 years. In terms of how goods and services um, are moved and people are moved across our country. So uh, the bill and IRA actually invest across the entire supply chain for clean transportation from uh, infrastructure to programs and research that brings technologies um, to market and also into growing a workforce in our country that makes us more energy independent. So we produce these clean uh, fuel vehicles and the batteries in our own country. And so the incentives actually reflect that as well. So, the bills also affect multimodal transportation and provide money to communities to look at um, justice issues and to serve people who are not in cars and uh, buses, or well, it does provide for buses actually, but um, it engages local and state government partners and outcomes related to environmental justice as well. So in this webinar, um, we have, we're very blessed to have um, uh, speakers who are well-versed in this and uh, their, their bios were presented before, but um, we have Lori Lissick, who's the executive director of Wisconsin Clean Cities, Kayla Vanderweel with the Wisconsin Department of Transportation, and he's the Transportation Electrification Program Manager. And then um, Francisco Sayu from Renew Wisconsin, who's the Alternative Technologies Director. Um, we were also supposed to have Trevor Young from the city of uh, Racine as the transit manager manages their electric buses. Um, unfortunately, he wasn't able to attend, but we will provide you information uh, about that area as well. Um, it may be not as much in depth in the program, but definitely in our resources. This program is being recorded and the presenter slides will be available to you. So don't panic about getting everything down. And then we will also provide links to all the resources we talked about and more. So with that, I'm gonna turn the program over to Lori um, Lissick today. Okay, thank you, Sherry. Can everyone see my slides okay? Yes, thank you. Great. Thank you. So as Sherry mentioned, I have served as the executive director of Wisconsin Clean City since 2011. And if you're not familiar with Wisconsin Clean Cities, we are part of a national network of clean cities organizations across this country. They're not a thing. 
There we go. So we are part of a national network of Clean Cities organizations across the country. There's nearly 75 coalitions. Since 1994, Wisconsin Clean Cities has supported energy and economic security through the partnerships um, to advance affordable domestic transportation fuels and advanced mobility technologies throughout the state of Wisconsin. Wisconsin is in a unique position in that we have a variety of alternative fuels and vehicles that are traveling along our corridors. And our portfolio is one of fuel neutrality. Being that there is not one solution right now for the transportation sector. Since 2005, I've worked with fleets, businesses and consumers to identify sustainable solutions to address transportation needs. As the executive director of Wisconsin Clean Cities and together with our board of directors, we have assisted in securing over $40 million in federal funding since 2011 that has been used to support clean transportation throughout the state and across the Midwest. And as Sherry mentioned why clean transportation, and she did highlight some of the reasons that we need to really look at this, but one of those is that the transition to clean energy provides our state with the opportunity to reduce the funds that are being sent out of our state for the production of fossil fuels. These dollars can be used to invest in clean energy and technologies and provide economic and energy security for our state. And this is a shared responsibility among all of our energy related industries. We have been working on a variety of grants and I just wanted to let you know a few of these that are happening in this state. Um, we have recently, um, are recently currently working on our Drive Electric Wisconsin grant, which is part of Drive Electric USA. And this is a program that is looking to implement the use of infrastructure for electric vehicles and electric vehicles into the state. We're also part of the Drive Clean Rural program. And this is a part, um, this is a seven, um, part of seven different communities across the country that are working to address issues in the rural communities and be able to help them to move forward in clean transportation. Our Empower Grant is a workplace charging grant that's just getting started in Wisconsin, and we're looking for workplaces that are interested in implementing EV infrastructure to support the use of electricity for their employees. So if you are a corporation or a company that is interested in this, please feel free to reach out to, the, to us regarding that. As Sherry mentioned, Caleb is going to be on the call next, and he is going to be speaking about the um, Wisconsin EV infrastructure program. Uh, additionally, we have a Wisconsin Smart Fleet program in which we can help to identify opportunities for fleets to move to clean transportation through assessments that we can do, and then recognize you for your efforts. So we're excited to get um, some new fleets involved in that program. We're finishing up a project with heavy duty EV demonstration products, projects for freight and mobility solutions. And then also we are sitting on um, as a uh, mentor on a zero emission freight future program that is being done across the country. We've completed the M2M to -M I-94 corridor project in which we made that corridor um, viable for natural gas, propane and electric that finished last year. And um, we finished a project on multi-unit dwellings. So we have a lot of information that is available on our website for those of you that are looking to implement EV infrastructure into multi-unit dwellings. We've worked on EPA DARA grants to help to lower our emissions at the ports. And we just finished a Safer 2 grant with the Wisconsin Office of Energy Innovation in which we looked at working with rural communities and looking at resiliency efforts across the state. And the Natural Gas Vehicle Uptime Grant completed and that was an opportunity for us to look at um, the ways that natural gas has um, affected our um, emission reductions as compared to diesel. So you can see we've been quite busy and have been working in this space for a long time and look forward to um, continuing that work. The transportation um, sector emissions, as Sherry mentioned, in Wisconsin accounts for 27% of our emissions. Last year, Wisconsin Clean Cities, together with our stakeholders and members, showed a reduction of over 314 tons of greenhouse gas emissions that were diverted by the use, by um, the implementation of alternative fuels. And that took a greenhouse gas link gallon equivalent reduction of 48 million gallons. So we're very um, proud of those efforts that we have been doing and striving across the country for many, or across the state and across the country for many years. Strategies that avoid or reduce our fossil dependence are critical to creating a clean, resilient transportation system, and those directly affect the, affect the climate change in Wisconsin. So we will continue this mission and we are at a point where it's kind of to be 
careful what you wish for. Funding has become nearly, um, we are at really monumental funding opportunities that are available. And every day I'm getting calls about um, funding opportunities. So what we're going to do today, my goal is to provide you with some insight, guidance, and suggestions to address your role regarding funding. And most importantly, I wanna help you to get grant ready. There are many factors to consider as we travel through this funding opportunity and much, which I have been heard this time that we're in right now has been referred to as the messy middle. So I'm wondering how many of you today feel that you are grant ready or are you navigating this messy middle? And we're, help, we're here to help you with, to provide strategies to help you implement this process. So first of all, understanding that each grant is different and it is important to also understand the mission of the grant grantors and looking at some of these factors that might play a role in how you are going to apply for this grant. The first step is to identify if you are an eligible entity. So understanding what your company makeup is and having a design plan, a plan that can maybe be used and manipulated to work with a very a variety of grant applications. And this is going to help to save you time and help you to save you the stress in the process. Also identifying partners ahead of time is very imperative. If we wait until the grants are announced and try to develop those relationships, that's gonna be very difficult. But if we're thinking ahead and have this plan in place and have our partners in place, that's gonna put us ahead of this step. So we want to encourage you to really be grant ready. We are in unprecedented funding times and it's been difficult to prepare for these grants because the fundings are coming so quickly. However, being ready can make all of the difference for a successful application. Previously, we might have been able to know when certain funding opportunities would be announced and what type of projects these um, agencies would fund and you could do your research. But at the fast pace that these funding are coming now, it's, it's been a little bit more difficult. So we're here to help you and to help you work through this process. It's important to realize too that grants are not free money and that part of the grant readiness is measuring your organization's ability and capacity to do research, to apply, to secure, and to manage the grant. And in preparing that, I've listed some questions that you may want to consider. So understanding your organization structure is vital to ensure your eligibility status, as I mentioned previously. Are you a public entity, a nonprofit, a for-profit business? a WBE, a women business enterprise, a minority business enterprise, are you veteran known? Can your organization demonstrate success based on previous projects or successful grant projects? What is your financial status and do you have systems in place? Are you up to date on all your local, state and federal requirements? What's your organization mission and who are your customers? Who are your benefactors? Can you secure the required financial and or cost share match? If a project is $500,000 and you've received 80% funding, can you provide that needed $100,000? And where is that going to come from? Federal funding also has additional considerations. Reading the RFP or the request for proposal and making sure you understand all of these requirements is gonna be imperative to your success in the grant. If a NOFO, a Notice of Funding Opportunity, is announced, make sure you review it and provide questions to the funding agency before the announcement is made. Once the funding announcement is made, the agencies are hampered by their ability to answer your questions. With current federal funding, also understanding your Justice 40 designation is going to be important as funding percentages are designated for these areas. Formulating a workforce plan and a labor plan is also going to be key for current federal fundings. Also, registration is required on certain federal um, sites. So like your SAM.gov or grants.gov, you need to be registered. And these registration times are taking longer and must be completed in order to apply. Also, there may be federal laws such as the Davis-Bacon requirements that need to be taken into consideration and other criteria that you need to address when looking at federal funding. Identifying funding opportunities can also be challenging. And I've listed a couple of places where you might look for some of these grant opportunities. Again, if the grant is one that is funded on a regular schedule, you can anticipate when it might be announced. 
So some of these areas that you might want to look for grants would be at grants.gov. Some of the federal agency websites also will have sections on grants. Our state agencies also have websites that announce where grants are being um, listed. Industry partner websites are also a way to do that and industry newsletters. Also foundations, community groups and agencies. Also on the Alternative Fuel Data Center, there's an opportunity to look for grant funding. And then also on our website, we do maintain a list of grants that are available. Um, as I mentioned, Caleb is going to talk about um, the NEVI plan, the Wisconsin NEVI plan, um, and the Wisconsin electrification in, in, under the Wisconsin electrification initiative. Um, there is also two and a half billion dollars, which is discretionary funding, and I'm sure that many of you are aware that this was announced recently and is due May 30th, which is a short time frame to develop these projects and partnerships. And this funding is part of the two and a half billion from the formula program. This first round is for seven hundred million dollars. Uh, Caleb is going to cover about the corridor charging, and I just wanted to talk a little bit about the community charging program. Again, as I mentioned, the application due date is May 30th. 350 million has been set aside for community charging and the fueling program. The total federal award cannot exceed 80% of the project cost. And the specific list of eligible entities is part of the application. So you need to make sure that you qualify and are one of those public entities that can apply for this funding. However, you can partner with private industry. Also for educational and community engagement activities, you cannot exceed 5% of the grant amount awarded. For the community grants, the minimum war award is $500,000 and the maximum award is $15 million. I did want to make um, note that these are not just for electric or for electric infrastructure, but also have you have the opportunity to apply for hydrogen, propane for medium and heavy duty vehicles, and natural gas vehicle fueling infrastructure. Um, again, you may use these funds to contract with private entities. Um, you must address environmental justice. These stations must be accessible and usable by individuals with disabilities and must be publicly accessible. Webinars have been held and are being held and information can be found on the Joint Office website, which is a collaboration with the USDOT, the US Department of Energy, the USDA and HUD. This is a brief overview of the funding and keeping in mind hours of webinars have been held on this one topic. So it's important to note that funding is not only um, again, for the deployment of EV infrastructure, but there are also other criteria that can be covered. And that information would be available um, at these websites. And then also your, the webinars have been recorded so that you can listen to those. Um, again, Caleb's going to talk about the corridor grants, but I wanted to also, as Sherry had mentioned, there are some other federal funding opportunities that are available. One of those is the low and no emission transit bus program. And this is through the USDOT. And this is an opportunity to be able to fund for funding for, funding for um, the transit buses. Um, we will, like Sherry said, share some information on that, but there are also uh, funding for marine projects that are out there available right now through the US DOT. There is also the Energy Efficiency and Conservation Block Grant Program, which is available, which does have an opportunity um, for the transportation sector for emission reduction grants. The 2023 National DARA Program from the US EPA will be announced um, later this year. Our US Department of Agriculture also has um, information on grants that are available there. There are grants for electric vehicles, for uh, feasibility studies, so you might want to take a look there. Um, the Joint Office of Energy and Transportation is the site that I really want to direct you to. A lot of this information is being handled through that site, um, and they are up it is up and running. Um, they are every day adding new information, but you would um, there's much information that can be found there. Um, there are also uh, a rural program, a roadmap to rural communities to be able to um, implement um, alternative fuels and um, EVs. And that information is also listed on the Joint Office um, of Energy and Transportation. 
again, the US Department of Energy has a program out right now called Clean Energy to Communities or the C2C program. Uh, the website is there. This is an opportunity for communities and tribal organizations to work with the um, National Renewable Energy Laboratory. There is some funding that is available. There is also an opportunity to work with your local Clean Cities organization um, on a feasibility study for EVs. And if you are interested in applying for that program, the application is due by May 8th. It's an online application, and I would be happy to discuss that with you if you are a community that's looking to um, get involved with in that space. We would be happy to partner with you on that. Um, additionally, there's an opportunity to get technical assistance from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory through this program. So I would, um, as a community or a tribal organization, um, look to that program to um, move forward with those endeavors. There are some funding opportunities at a local level as well. Um, the Wisconsin Office of Energy Innovation Public Service Commission will be having their energy innovation grants coming out later this year. Those were just recently announced. Um, and so that gives you an opportunity um, as someone who might apply for this additional funding to go back and see what was funded through that program right now and maybe prepare for some of those opportunities. Also, the Wisconsin DNR will have the DARA funding that will be coming out also through um, the Wisconsin Department of Agriculture, Trade and Consumer Protection. There are some funding grants as well on that website. Also, our utilities also have their incentive programs for EV infrastructure. So you wanna check with your utility website to see what your utility is offering and reach out to them. There are also federal tax incentives and tax credits that are available. You can find those on the Alternative Fuel Data Center um, under the laws section. Um, I also have in our resources, there is a link to EV Info, which um, is a listing of all of the electric vehicles that are available in our area. And also it shows what types of vehicles, it tells you all of the um, dimensions and the parameters of the vehicles, but it also tells you what the tax, federal tax credit is for each of those vehicles. So that's a great tool to be able to use and that's um, in our resources. And then also Renew Wisconsin has EV for good program, which is for Wisconsin nonprofits. Tools have been established by our national laboratories and agency and um, take into consideration that each agency may have a particular calculator that they want you to use when you are doing your um, applications. Um, but this is a list of um, some of those tools that are available through the Alternative Fuel Data Center. Um, when preparing for your grant applications, some of this information can be used in numerous situations. For example, we help to conduct fleet assessments through some of our funding. And um, understanding your fleet composition and having your fuel usage records for each vehicle, understanding your vehicle replacement plan, understanding the miles traveled by those vehicles are going to be important statistics to have as you go to use some of these calculators to be able to plug that information in and help you to determine your base um, fleet, your baseline for your fleet. Um, from there, we can determine vehicle replacements and cost savings and emission reduction goals. There's also calculators where you can actually do a side-by-side -side comparison of vehicles. So say if you have a fleet of diesel vehicles and you're looking to implement electric or natural gas or propane, you can actually do a side-by-side -side comparison and it will show you and calculate those differences for you. Understanding also how you are going to use the infrastructure is imperative to determining a successful deployment strategy and also understanding cost involved and pre-planning for that is the key. Having your cost proposals in hand rather than trying to work with providers under a grant application deadline is a great strategy. And understanding the cost, for example, that, the, that a level two networked charger can cost between 20 to $25,000, depending on deployment costs, location, availability of electricity and site preparation, not to mention the availability of equipment, will be necessary information as you move forward with your applications. And we will work with our stakeholders and members to assist in using and identifying the usage of these tools that are developed through the US Department of Energy. My last slides 
as I mentioned before, are resources and references for you to be able to use. And um, Sherry will be sharing this information with you, but I have put um, several opportunities for you to access um, some of the sites that we have talked about um, and make that easy for you to move forward with some of this information. At the bottom here is the EV info list um, that I mentioned earlier. Um, that lists all of the vehicles that are available. So take a look at some of these um, resources and use them as you design and implement your plan for grant applications. Um, just a, a quick, some quick information on Wisconsin Clean Cities. We are a membership-based organization um, and would love to have you um, join our membership and um, take part in our trainings and our webinars. And we'd love to collaborate with other um, organizations. And we were so honored to have um, Sherry ask us to present on this webinar today. We are also right now planning our Transportation and Innovation Expo, which is a partnership with Madison Gas and Electric, Alliant Energy, and the City of Madison. Um, this is held at the Alliant Energy Center, will be held October 11th. We have 100 thousand square feet indoors that we will be displaying all types of alternative fuel vehicles. There'll be an opportunity for education and then we'll also have um, ride and drives outside. So it will be a great day to bring everyone together in the transportation sector and to learn from each other and to collaborate. Um, so we're very um, excited about this opportunity coming up on October 11th. This is my contact information and please feel free to reach out if you have any questions on anything that we um, have discussed here today. Um, you can um, check out our website, um, contact me directly, and um, we would be happy to assist you and answer any questions that you might have moving forward in your um, funding initiatives. So thank you very much. Thank you, Lori. We really appreciate it. That was a lot of information. If you have questions to ask, please put them in the chat. Um, we are going to have Q&A later in the session, and um, everyone would be um, I'm happy to answer your questions. Okay, Caleb. Sherry, thank you so much, and thank you for the time this afternoon. I have about uh, 10 minutes to be with you all today, and in those 10 minutes, I am going to uh, focus on um, a couple really important components of the department's work to uh, support transportation electrification in the state of Wisconsin. Um, having some issues with my slide presentation, so just give me a second here. Here we go. So today, in the next couple of minutes, I'm going to focus on uh, what the department's doing, uh, where uh, where we are, are focusing our efforts, and then really how you can start to prepare for these efforts. Um, as uh, Lori had mentioned, uh, we do have uh, funding under the National Electric Vehicle Formula Program. Uh, and then as she had mentioned, uh, the discretionary programs have been released for uh, fiscal year 22 and 23. And I'll touch on, on both of these a little bit as I work through my presentation. Um, the foundation of what the department's been working on, and, and as I see a lot of familiar names on the call today, uh, we've been really focused on uh, the National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Program uh, that was released in February of last year, uh, and this is the program that we're currently working towards uh, implementing today. Under the National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Program, uh, we do really have a specific usage of the dollars that the state's being provided. Uh, and really that is funding electric vehicle charging stations on our alternative fuel corridor system. Projects have to be every 50 miles on that system within a travel mile of that system. The program funds a very substantial charging activity. Uh, and the fact that we're funding four charging ports at 150 kilowatt per hour simultaneously. Uh, this is a level three fast charger, uh, which is really a, a 20 minute charging activity. Um, so there are, are some costs that are involved with that. Uh, but again, it, this will really increase overall mobility. Uh, to be able to utilize dollars under the program, uh, we had to submit a plan to FHWA uh, that has been since approved, and we are currently in our process of preparing our year two plan submittal to federal highways uh, to continue to be compliant with program requirements. Uh, little details on, on, on how the department works uh, is working towards the program. 
uh, Wistot's not intending to own and operate charging stations. Uh, rather, uh, we are going to utilize the funding to help support private businesses install, operate, own, and maintain charging stations. I'm going to talk a little bit on, on the rule and, and what that means for these charging stations, uh, but primarily the final rule for the program dictates the installation, maintenance, and operation requirements of all charging stations funded by the program. Uh, one of the pieces I'll be focusing on in a couple slides is that site location is going to be a critical component of eligibility uh, for our grant program. Uh, one of the challenges we really see in the state of Wisconsin right now is um, a lower number of EVs compared to uh, some of our neighboring states. And, and one of the reasons why we think we're a little bit behind is there really is a, uh, a lack of publicly available fast charging stations and charging stations in many areas in the state of Wisconsin. Um, but we are starting to see a, a really sharp uptick in electric vehicles the last two years in the state uh, and really excited about um, really excited about where the transition appears to be headed. As we started thinking about the program, uh, we really wanted to um, really determine what the department's role and responsibility is with transportation electrification. Uh, and we determined that our effort uh, should be supporting uh, both interstate and inner city fast charging. Uh, in the NEVI program, the way it's set up, we think really provides that type of a focus. Uh, as I had mentioned for the NEVI program, uh, we're really focused on level three fast chargers. Uh, that NEVI final rule uh, builds out those requirements. Um, but one of the things I'll touch on here as well is under the discretionary program, specifically the corridor program, the corridor program is allowed to fund level two chargers in place of level three chargers. As I mentioned uh, about eligibility, eligibility for uh, the program is, is really tethered to um, the geographic location of a project, primarily being within one travel mile of our alternative fuel corridor system in the state. Uh, thankfully, we have a, a very robust system of approximately 2,000 miles, uh, which will allow us to support projects all over the state of Wisconsin, which we're, we're very excited about. It also mentioned that every 50 miles uh, is our goal for project siting. Uh, and again, that will allow an individual to plan uh, where they want to stop on the system and have multiple opportunities on any one of these routes across the state of Wisconsin. As we thought about the program and, and thinking about where we want to be funding projects, uh, we did an analysis looking at the whole system. Uh, in general, we believe that there are, are locations that best suit projects, uh, and there's locations that, that do not suit projects. Uh, two critical things for us. We can't fund grid capacity expansion with the dollars, um, but um, we can fund uh, that connection to the grid. So really we are looking to tether projects to uh, areas where that grid capacity is currently already in place. Uh, here's an example that we think would be a good candidate. Um, we have multiple big box store locations. We have a truck stop, a few gas stations, a few restaurants. We make a general assumption that grid capacity exists. Uh, and as a result, uh, could support a project. Also, if you're sitting somewhere charging, you may want to get something to eat. So uh, we are, are really interested in the overall uh, experience of those chargers. Uh, because we can't fund grid capacity and we're also thoughtful about what uh, an individual may be doing while they're at a charger, uh, we in general don't have preference towards a location that has nothing at an exit or an interchange, or uh, there's just maybe one location. Overall, we're looking to support uh, approximately uh, 60 to 63 locations across the state of Wisconsin. Uh, this will be and provide uh, a really substantial uptick in publicly available fast charging in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, again, with a focus on uh, geographic distribution of these charging stations across the state. Uh, getting into uh, how you can prepare for this, um, th the first thing that I want to highlight is what we call the National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Standards and Requirements. This is the final rule that's been in place since the end of March. Now, to be clear on, on a really interesting component of this program rule, this program rule applies to the NEVI program, uh, but it also applies to the discretionary programs as well. So if you look at the NOFA for the discretionary programs uh, and you want to understand what type of charging stations, what type of charging activities are funded, you can go to the National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Standard Requirements and you can look at the different uh, requirements for charging stations under that rule. One of, of the key components of, of, the, um, of the rule is that charging stations funded by uh, Title 23 transportation dollars have to sell electricity by the kilowatt per hour. 
Lori did a, a really good job discussing the different uh, the different discretionary grant programs. Uh, we as a department are, are working on uh, really looking at what opportunities are available here. But again, um, the program this year for both the community grant program and the quarter grant program uh, is just fiscal year 22 and $23. Uh, and there will be additional years of programs. So um, uh, very excited for uh, these opportunities as well. Uh, another requirement that I want to touch on just here uh, at 30,000 foot view level, um, any charging station funded under the NEVI program or the discretionary programs will have to follow a Buy America requirement for electric vehicle charging stations. Um, it is a layered in approach over the next year or so. Uh, if anybody would like to have a more in-depth conversation about how to approach uh, this topic area, we are, are happy to have that conversation. Um, right now, uh, with STOT, we are, are still in uh, the development of the program, uh, working uh, fast and furiously towards a, a launch of the program. Uh, there are some activities that go along uh, with this, um, with these activities, including uh, still working to really understand some of the, the granular details of the final rule, the Buy America requirement, uh, how we may intersect with the discretionary programs. Um, but, but we are really excited with all the information we've seen the last couple of months. The last thing I want to touch on here is the um, a couple resources uh, that you can lean into as you're starting to think about these programs. Uh, the first of all is, is again the NEVI program requirements. That final rulemaking, it's about 144 page document, really is helpful in understanding what type of activities are being funded. From a more uh, probably practical perspective, uh, the U.S. Department of Energy uh, provides um, some really helpful guidance on. Uh, electric vehicle charging station development. Uh, that information is really helpful if you're just starting to look at electrification. Uh, and then a couple other additional activities that, that we do generally recommend is having conversations with your, your electric utility provider uh, if you have a location that's identified. And, and then lastly, um, start coordinating with a preferred electric vehicle supply equipment vendor, a charging station company. There's different types of ownership and operation models um, that really Many of those models uh, really fit uh, whatever your, your business case may be for whatever type of charging you want to support. Uh, with that, uh, the department uh, is working very quickly at this point to get ready for the program. Um, but it is it is a, a really a corporate effort. Uh, if there's any interest in having any follow up conversations uh, with the department, uh, I am always available as well as my colleague Brian Elliott. Uh, we are, are happy to answer questions um, uh, and have conversations as needed. With that, thank you for the time. Yes, thank you, Caleb. <laughs> That's really exciting, um, especially having just made a trip across Wisconsin in my EV. Um, I can't wait till the charging infrastructure is more filled out than, than it was. Anyway, um, so to talk, to switch gears a little bit, um, Francisco from Renew Wisconsin is gonna talk to you about uh, electric school buses. So for any of you um, involved in your schools and local governments, this would be, um, should be really enlightening. Thank you, Francisco. Thank you, Sherry, and uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to join this conversation. My name is Francisco Saju. I am the Emerging Technology Director at Renew Wisconsin. Here at Renew, I support beneficial electrification, which includes the electrification of our transportation sector. And for the next 10 minutes, I'm going to be talking about my favorite subject, which is uh, electric school buses. I wanna do a sound check. You guys can hear me okay, and slides are looking good. All right. Yep, we can hear you and slides look great. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much for that. Let me go to the next slide. Uh, so before I start, uh, let me tell you a little bit about Renew Wisconsin. So Renew is a nonprofit organization dedicated to building a stronger, healthier, and more vibrant state of Wisconsin through the advancement of renewable energy. We support policies and programs that uh, support solar power, wind power, biofuels, uh, local hy hydropower, and electric vehicles. We have been around for over 30 years supporting the transition to clean energy in the state, and we're looking forward to continuing this work in the future. So as I mentioned earlier, I am here to talk about uh, electric school buses. 
You might also hear me uh, refer to these as zero emission buses or clean school buses, because these buses can be powered with 100% clean uh, renewable energy from solar or wind that can be generated locally here in Wisconsin. Whether or not we're currently generating enough clean energy to power these buses is the subject of a different conversation, uh, but the fact is that we can and we should generate our own transportation fuels in the state. So this is gonna be a high level conversation uh, and I look forward to going into more details with you during the Q&A if you're interested in that. So with that, let's uh, look at some facts. So why school buses? Uh, school buses are important because they travel over 3 billion miles annually providing transportation for more than 25 million children daily. And most school buses in the US run on diesel fuel. Diesel fuel creates uh, tailpipe pollution, which causes a wide range of health issues. And children are more, more vulnerable to diesel pollution than adults. Uh, also, and this is interesting, it was interesting for me to learn this, the air inside the school bus can be more polluted than the air outside of it. So what is the solution? Electric school buses. Electric school buses can cut emissions uh, in communities burdened by air pollution and high rates of childhood asthma. And electric school buses are also about 60% uh, cheaper to operate and maintain than uh, diesel school buses. We are very fortunate that in 2021, the federal government passed the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, also known as the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. And this law gave us the Clean School Bus Program. And this is what we're gonna be talking about uh, for the next few minutes. So the program, is, it is a five-year, $5 billion program, and the goals are to replace existing school buses with new clean buses that produce either zero or low tailpipe emissions compared to the older diesel predecessors. It's, it's also intended to uh, uh, upgrade buses, and uh, buses up, uh, that will be upgraded to, under this program will result in cleaner air, uh, on the bus, on the loading areas, and in the communities in which these buses operate. The eligible applicants for the clean school bus programs are state and local government entities responsible for providing bus services to one or more public school system, nonprofit school transportation associations, Indian tribes, tribal organizations, or tribally controlled schools, and eligible transportation contractors. So in 2022, the Environmental Protection Agency, which is the organization, well, the agency that's managing this program, released the first round of funding. Uh, and it was announced in the, in the, in the summer, actually. Uh, $500 million were announced for this. Uh, the APA ended up increasing that funding to almost a million, given the overwhelming interest in the program. But for this first round of funding, the program was a rebate program. So the clean school bus rebate program. The program uh, had a very simple online application. It was a lottery system using a random number generator. And the uh, funding opportunity prioritized, prioritized high end need districts and low income rural areas uh, and tribal districts about 100, actually exactly 198 priority school districts in Wisconsin were part of the priority list for that first round of funding. The awards under the rebate program were up to $375,000 per electric bus and school district could apply for up to 25 buses at a time. The program also provide up to $20,000 for EV charging stations or schools interested in propane or natural gas could apply for funding uh, between thirty to forty-five thousand dollars for uh, for those repowers. Awards for that first round of funding were announced uh, last fall, uh, and I'm very happy to report that Wisconsin was very fortunate. We received twenty-five point six million dollars in awards. Uh, that's enough to purchase sixty-five electric school buses uh, and the charging infrastructure to go along with that. The next step for these school districts that were selected is to submit their payment request form with their purchase orders, and that's coming up soon. By April 28, uh, school districts must submit their purchase requests, including an invoice for both the bus and the EV charging infrastructure. 
and the school districts must receive their new buses and install their charging stations by, by October of 2024. Here is a map with the showing the school districts that receive awards. Uh, and also the bars on the map show the magnitude of the awards. But the next slide actually has the actual list of the school districts that receive awards. So these are only uh, electric school bus awards. There were some school districts that receive awards for uh, uh, propane repowers. Those are not listed here, but you can see some districts requested one bus just, just to kind of give it a try and see how it goes, a bus and uh, a charging station. Uh, and we have the Minocqua School District that actually received uh, 12 buses. So a very ambitious goal. And we're happy to see that the whole range of uh, uh, in levels of implementations. So what is in the future? Uh, the clean a school bus program, as I mentioned, is a five-year program, so there is plenty of time and opportunity to bring more electric school buses to the great state of Wisconsin, uh, but we must start acting now. So here's what's going to happen over the next few months. The EPA intends to make another billion dollars available in 2023 for the clean school bus program. This is going to consist of the first round of competitive grants, and we're still waiting to see the details on these competitive grants, but uh, it, they will probably be available to schools that are not in the priority list. And then there will be a second round of the rebate program, similar to what we saw last year during the summer and fall uh, for those schools that are prioritized. So a school districts that are on the priority list must get ready to complete that application, that online application once it becomes available. Uh, as soon as it opens, this is probably going to be another lottery system, but the school district needs to make sure that they get that application on time uh, because uh, signing up for the account and all the, those things can take time. So you don't want to waste any time. Make sure that you get your application early. And then school districts that are not included in the priority list must start building their teams and building partnerships in preparation to compete for funding announcements. And you know some of the previous speakers talk about uh, some of the things that you could do to build those partnerships and the reasons why you should do that. Happy to go into more detail into the questions as well. Uh, but it is important that we start acting right away. This is this is great funding uh, and it is available. I mean, it's basically it's basically free buses. And um, just some more details in preparing. So so you know what do you do to prepare for funding? Uh, here are a few things that you can do. Talk to your transportation contractors and make sure that you have uh, that they are on board, because uh, our school districts that don't operate their buses directly, but they use a contractor. There is a mechanism for those districts to apply and to get electric buses, even if they don't operate the buses themselves. Talk to your electric utility because your electric utility is going to provide the electricity, the fuel that you need to for these buses. And in some cases, you're going to need uh, to build grid capacity and make sure that you have the great capacity that you are going to need to power your buses. Uh, partner, for all, partner with other school districts, especially, this is especially important for school districts that are not in the priority list to make sure that you're, there is power in numbers, that you're building your partnerships and you can develop stronger applications. Educate your community about the benefits of electric buses. And this is very, very important. One of the challenges that we are noticing with the current uh, implementation is that because this is happening so fast, uh, communities don't have a lot of, some communities don't have a lot of awareness and understanding of the benefits of electric buses. And uh, school districts are now getting a lot of support from their communities. We need to change that. We need to educate our communities. We need to get our community support behind the school districts so they can they can do this because this is something they don't have to do. The school districts are doing it because it's good, but some of them are doing it alone. We don't want that to be the case for the five years of the program. Explore additional funding opportunities. There is funding out there, uh, and some of the speakers already mentioned some of that funding. Uh, the Community Fueling Infrastructure Grant Program is one of the opportunities that is available. And the school districts are actually eligible to apply for that funding. So uh, explore funding, additional funding that can help you be successful with your implementation. And last but not least, uh, please contact Renew Wisconsin. We're here uh, and we're happy to help. That is my last slide. Uh, thank you.
for the for the opportunity. I am happy to talk about electric school buses. Uh, here's my contact information. Feel free to reach out. Um, and and again, it is it is a, a fantastic program. Uh, I hope you can take advantage of it. Thank you so much, Francisco. Well, we're at the point where um, if you have questions, um, we'd love to hear them and our speakers would be open to answering them and, and having discussions with you. So um, I think, as I said, the presentations are all going to be available. If you register, you will get a link um, maybe later today. Uh, we are recording the session, so you'll be able to listen to it as well. That'll take a few days to get up because we want to make sure that um, they're available to everyone. So um, one of the questions we had is if the grants would, are offered every year around the same time that the May 30th timing um, and this is for the EV charging grant that Lori had spoken about um, deadline.